We're here at Old Arizona, located on the White Stallion Ranch in Tucson, Arizona. We have with us today a famous Western artist, Jack Sorensen, and we're here to hear the story of his life and how he was able to become such a talent and a gift to anyone that sees his work. Jack? Well, I'll tell you, I could always draw from the time I was... Well, I asked my mom one time, she said, I used to always put our dog up on the couch and draw him and if he jumped down before I was done I would slam my tablet down and I said mom I don't remember that how old was I and she said three so it's a total gift from God and I've been drawing western buildings like this my family we were fortunate to buy part of land around Paladero Canyon and my dad was always nuts about westerns like I was, so that's what I grew up with. And so we decided to build a western town, <clears throat> and his main idea was to have gunfights and rent horses. And so that developed from that into 40 buildings and a long western street. And I just, he didn't like to design stuff like that, so I just, from a very early age, I would go to all these movie sets all over the country because my dad knew all the people that owned them. And I would study those movie sets as an artist, seeing how they put those different buildings together. And it just became a hobby of mine. And so I got more and more intricate with Six Gun City, our place, and how it was designed. And I had John Mantley, the producer of Gunsmoke, was there one time after he had retired, but he said, who who built your town? And I said, I did. <laughs> and you were old then? I'll, I'll probably 16. <laughs> so. But I, I've always been fascinated with it. And so when we didn't have Six Gun City anymore after it burned, I started just incorporating those ideas into my paintings. And that's where this uh, building came from. Mm -hmm. I will, I will play around with gingerbread. I've always been fascinated by those Victorian houses with all the fancy gingerbread. And so I always try to incorporate those in an interesting way above whatever the storyline is in mm -hmm. the painting. Mm -hmm. And this saloon's a perfect example of it. I've, you know, I will, will see a building in a movie and if they have a certain window I like or certain capitals or whatever, and I'll incorporate those into my building. So there's not a building anywhere on earth that looks like this except this one, but you might see elements of it, you know, the capital or something else like that. Mm hmm mm hmm And the uh, little models that you made, you made those out of balsa wood? Out of balsa wood. My, my dad saw Walt Disney one time on uh, TV talking about when they were gonna build Disney World and it was all miniatures. He had everything done so you could see every angle and everything. So my dad said, instead of just sketching those, why don't you make them for me and let me see how they're gonna look. And he would even hold a light up to see how the shadows were gonna hit on the, each of those little buildings. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the, towards the end, I began just by doing sketches, but mm -hmm. towards the end I would build those mm -hmm. miniature buildings. Well, I've learned so much from you in the conversations we've had over these last couple, three years. But one of the most valuable ones is is how you is how you explain standing in the center of the street and what you see looking in both directions. One of the best movie sets I ever visited was Eve's Ranch, and right after they built that town for and Eve's uh, Ranch, that's J.W. Eve's in Santa Fe. In Santa mm -hmm. Fe, and my dad and J.W. were great friends, and. When they were building that set for Shine Social Club, I was talking to the art director there and he was telling them how he wanted from that center intersection, he said, I gotta see this. And they were showing where every building, every facade was gonna be and how the different angles would work. And I learned a lot watching them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of, that was always, I thought the, the ultimate set and so I learned and just started incorporating that in my paintings when I'd show a town scene. You know, I'd make sure every building was interesting compared to the building next to it. And, you know, in, in art, you always have to have that interest of line. And so, yeah, I incorporate that into mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any formal uh, training 
for the art that you were gifted with, or is it just always coming right out of you? No, I've I've studied with 37 different artists, and any famous Western artist you can name, I studied with. But as far as designing the building and stuff like that, I didn't. I have one of my closest friends as a engineer and architect, and when I was in high school, he and I were best buds, and I had taken every art class you could take, and I thought, well, I'll take architecture, maybe I'll, that'll mm. help me. And so I went in there, and he said, we hated you. And I said, why? And he said, because you could draw this stuff <laughs> faster. You know, they would set up a thing for supposed to take three weeks, and I'd be done in two days, <laughs> and just because of drawing all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he loved how I designed stuff and how I approached it. I always approach it as a visual thing. Being an artist, I want it to be pleasing visually. And, you know, symmetry of line is everything in art and it's everything in designing a Western town. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about on the way over about uh, the, 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 the three stories. And in my observations, there's not that many of them in a, in a Western town. And that seems like the tallest building always is in the center of town like at the intersection exactly okay yeah so so at this intersection here which where, which corner would that tall building be on would it be on that side so you're not screwing the view up here exactly right and it would be in the sun if it's on that side and that's kind of your foundation you're jumping off point for the rest of the town the rest of the street okay so then that would be facing west so you get that afternoon sun against it oh sure okay. and you get the low light sun both in morning and evening mm -hmm. it, you know movie companies love that when you have a whatever the storyline is mm -hmm. the saloon or hotel is going to be a prominent part of it mm -hmm. and so that would probably be your three-story okay one what uh, as far as the the balancing and all that what would be next to the three-story building then well, you mean as a as a uh, what the building was or the design of it? Or, yeah, the the uh, I, I suppose it could be whatever anybody decided they wanted it to be. But would that next building be like a two story building or would it? Oh matter? yeah. Okay. No, yeah, you couldn't put a little small building next to that, or it would lose its significance totally. You have to gradually go down as you look down the street. Okay. But a, a huge building that'd be three stories is going to be pretty square. Mm -hmm. So the building next to it, you have to have a lot of angles to make up for that square. Again, symmetry of line. If if that building had a lot of angle and you could see the roofs and porches and stuff, then you wouldn't need that with mm -hmm. the building next to it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and from the Hollywood world, is it the production designer that is brought in that says this is how we're going to do it? It's, they call them different things, but oh. the art director art is director. usually the guy that comes in and he chooses the building designs and stuff like that. Do they also do the interiors? No, that's, they do, but that's a different crew as well. They, you know, th those are more set designers. And for like building Western towns, that the art director will come in and say, we need 32 shots of this and so any building that doesn't work in those 32 shots he needs they'll have to build something mm -hmm. and that's the way they approach it mm -hmm. but our directors are always thinking the same way i'm i'm telling you about mm -hmm. how each building shows is it up. does is that art director the same guy that does the interiors or is that a different person entirely i think it's i think the basic design is the same guy but i think they have somebody that set director comes in and the, the pieces that are inside there right how do you well two two questions for the but how do you get that glow you've got this magic gorgeous glow behind the uh windows at a certain time in the evening and mm -hmm. it's so warm and and welcoming and uh uh it that's definitely a gift but you know how do you do that and then uh, do you have have you ever had any experience with lighting people to be able to replicate that lighting people are always a, a, kind of a pain when you're on a movie set because it takes them so long to set up everything and if you get a quick downpour or something you got to move all that stuff away mm. but now those guys I don't, see I always approach it from the standpoint of an artist that's about to do a painting 
So when I'm doing the glow, I'm not thinking of how I would replicate that in a real building, but I think there's ways you could do it. Mm -hmm. You'd have to have yellow tinted lights, you know, mm -hmm. but I think there's ways they can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, distance from the, I call it boardwalk to boardwalk or hitching post to hitching post. Bob Shelton, who you said that you was a good friend of your father's. Bob right. was the founder of Old Tucson uh, here in Tucson. Uh, but uh, uh, he had always used that 30 to 35 feet width. Yeah, width. and Eve's Ranch was 40 feet exactly okay. across their street. I was told that that gives them enough room to back up and show the tops of the buildings as well as the front. For the photographer, the have, filming. Yeah, yeah, they have to have at least 40 to 50 feet to do that. And, uh, you know, at the end of Old Tucson, that street's no more than 20 feet across, but that's when they built those buildings for Arizona and they were always in the distance they never showed them up close and you know forced perspective you know what that is where they make the top floor instead of eight foot windows it's six and then the next floor is only five and they just forced perspective and that's the way old Tucson was built for Arizona when you look down that street that's why the street got more and more narrow to make it look like it's way down there see so it's forced perspective mm -hmm. Melody Ranch uh, Street, it does not have an intersection per se, it's got a, a, like an alley, right. like for the area where there were the, I call it the Doc Adams feature of this building, and, uh, but it's 600 feet long, and then it's got the 245s going off at the end, so that's where, that's where this 600 foot measurement came from, it's just that, oh, you know, that's how they do it. Sure. You know? Well, Six Gun City was uh, 100 yards long, so 300 feet, and uh, we had one major intersection in the center and there was a horse trough in the center and I used to tell people if you want the best photographs sit by that horse trough and you can look all four directions and it was a nice view and I s totally stole that from studying those movie sets. Mm -hmm. That's what and do you, you you say you did have an intersection? Yeah. And you had 300 did. feet? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How far how wide does the intersection need to be? It, well I'm figuring you know the same it went. Well, we had 40 feet. Dead Man's Alley was what we called our intersection across, and it was only 25 feet wide. Okay. But we had a church at the end of it, and so when you look, it looked like you had two main streets because right. the church was at the end of the intersection. Right. And you're talking about it, you may do it that way here. Well, it was suggested to me to have, instead of having it uh, like a, you know, a, a, a traditional four-way intersection to where it's, it's offset. A, a little bit, and uh, then and that it goes off at an angle. So when the camera's going by that intersection, uh, you're not seeing open territory. You're seeing as much of that street as that's, you can. Yeah, like, that's that, a good idea. Yeah, yeah that's what the, that was. But and it doesn't need to be that long. We were figuring it about maybe even 50 feet, maybe 100 feet. Yeah, but uh, not more than that. There's so many tricks these guys do because the camera doesn't have two eyes it's only got one so perspective they can totally lie about the perspective in a movie mm -hmm. and I've seen movie sets where they actually made the building smaller and smaller and smaller mm -hmm. as they mm -hmm. moved down the street but wow. you wouldn't want that here because you want people being able to go in the buildings every time mm -hmm. so. right was there ever any accommodation for stunt teams to be up on the roof or high shots or anything like that well any I've, platforms or anything yeah, a lot of a lot of the buildings, even at Old Tucson, uh, if it's a facade instead of a real building, a lot of times they'll build a backup stairway and have a, just a plywood platform for the. Nobody ever sees it except the stump man. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's the way they do mm -hmm. it. Did, did did they do that uh, on an as needed basis, or was it something that was built into the design? Of no, the... no. The, every movie that would come to film at a place, they would. One day I spent a whole afternoon watching a guy build a balsa wood. They were filming Santee with uh, Glenn Ford at Eve's Ranch, and they had they were building a balsa wood railing, the whole thing, and then he called the painters in to match the paint that was already there. So the section of the balsa wood was only about this wide, but the guy had to fly out of a window through that and down on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so the stump man was there helping him, and, and he said, uh, do I need to make, can it be real wood down on the bottom? Or how, he said, uh, he was telling them all how to do it, but it took them all afternoon to build this and paint it. And it's in that movie 
for three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but it made a cool shot. Right. But yeah. they did, see, that wasn't pre-made. That was just specifically for mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. one shot. One of the, uh, the best uh, sets that I have seen, uh, and there's lots of good ones out there, but uh, the way that, and I can't remember the, uh, the production designer's name is a lady that did de uh, Deadwood. Oh yeah. And uh, how they had it propped out and, and that it had just an incredible look to it. Uh, Deadwood also was able to incorporate, uh, even with Tombstone also it was filmed out here at Moscow, they were able to incorporate like, like traders tents or just canvas tents that were interspersed within the town. If you look at those reference photos, none of these towns were very permanent and they never knew how permanent they were gonna be. So. Sometimes, especially up in the mountains, half of the town would be tents with the wooden facade in front of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's totally accurate. I, th I think a lot of towns were, this, were mm -hmm. like that. You don't see that that much in the movies, but Deadwood and, uh, you know, Lonesome Dove and Tombstone, they really were meticulous about getting everything right. Right, yeah. That, that makes all the difference in the world, even... Uh, Peter Shereko did such a great job with oh, Tombstone. Oh, he's great with costume. Yes, man. and all, all the saddles and tack and firearms and all that uh, for the discerning eye when you can look at those minute little details and boy, man, did they get that right. And then it's just like everything else just kind of goes from there. Well, I've often wondered, they spend so much money making a movie, why don't they have a technical advisor that would make sure they get all those things right? Because I see John Wayne movies and He'll be unsaddling his horse and flip the stirrup up, and there'll be a Blevins buckle, which was invented in the 30s. And, you know, it's right. kind of, if you know that stuff, it kind of takes, it takes you away way. from the story. Yeah. So. Right. Yep. And even the firearms and some of, some of that also. It's a, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's a, uh, what I understood from Disney when he would walk through his town, and he, I call it Home Depot Silver, uh, or Chrome actually. Uh, if I could, if I can see the the chrome head of a screw, or I see any of that stuff that's sticking out, you know, you better get some paint and a Q-tip or something, but cover it up. And uh, that was Disney. You know, it was everything that needed to be authentic to where you could see it and or touch it. And um, and then from there on up, if it needed to be fiberglass, as long as it looked okay, it was all right. Yep. Jack, I'd, I'd like to hear more about your growing up in Amarillo, and uh, actually, you know, you, the. Uh, the time that you spent at Six Gun City, and then it unfortunately burned down too. And and uh, talk a little bit about that and what caused the fire. Sure. When my dad was a cutting horse trainer, and so we always had horses as I was growing up. But his goal was always to find a place where he could incorporate horses and guns. And like I said, we always watched westerns, and so he wanted. He decided we'd have a riding stable and build that western town and I was when my granddad and my dad bought the property and it's right at the entrance to Powder Canyon State Park uh, we had no idea how to do any of this stuff and so uh, we just started building it from buildings we'd see on have gun will travel and stuff like that mm -hmm. which were mostly back lot you know mm -hmm. and so that's how it started, but as I evolved as an artist, it got more and more intricate. And uh, so we, when we were done, when you come visit me at my, my home, you'll see I have several photographs of Six Gun City as mm -hmm. it, and you can see the evolution of the buildings as we went. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about when it burned down, uh, each of the facades at Six Gun City, it might look like a two-story building, but there would just be an apartment on the bottom floor of it. And we always usually had a real building on the bottom floor and then just brace the top facade. And so one of the tenants that was renting one of the apartments on the bottom uh, accidentally started a fire. And I, my granddad used to soak Here's how we got all the gingerbread locks on this building. We would, if any old home was to be torn down in Amarillo, my dad would contract that we would clear the lot if you gave us the gingerbread off that building because they don't make it anymore. Mm. You can have it custom made, but man, it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. So we would get that and then my granddad would soak it in linseed oil so the wood wouldn't fall apart when we put it on the buildings at Six Gun. And uh, so when, once that fire started it flew across the 40 feet to the other side oh. and burned the whole 
whole town, just like old Tucson, it just burned the whole thing mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought someone would buy it and rebuild it because it was it was like a little gold mine mm -hmm. <laughs> there right by the park and the Chamber of Commerce would bring tours down and I used to fall off a building. We had, <laughs> my wife tells me that's why I have arthritis now because every Saturday and Sunday I'd get shot off of a building and uh, <laughs> we had it so I'd flip over the front facade, roll down the porch, then fall and hit on a wagon and Gee. my only padding was uh, toe sacks with sawdust which are pretty soft the beginning of summer but by the end of summer they're hard as a rock so. <laughs> yeah but I, I loved every minute of that I started driving a stagecoach we had two stagecoaches we had a miniature and a large one and I started driving a miniature stagecoach when I was only 12 years old hmm. and so I got used to doing that it just went around the town our large stagecoach would go around the rim of the canyon and so when I got wow. old enough to drive the large stagecoach I loved it. Our home now is right on the rim in the middle of our stagecoach road, where the stagecoach road used to be. Wow. Well, did you have a six up or four up, or what was your standard? I never drove. I drove a four up in a Ford commercial one time. Uh, the guy, I told all my buddies at school, I was still in high school, I said, you know, when you film a commercial, they tell you all the times it's going to show and which channel and all that. So they sent us that. So I told all my buddies in school, I said, I'm going to be on a Ford commercial. And they said, when? I told them. And I said, I'm the stagecoach driver. Well, in the commercial, you see me in the distance driving the stagecoach into town, but the actor gets off the stagecoach and gets in the Ford and drives off. So they didn't believe it was me <laughs> <laughs> at all because I wasn't in any closer. Right. So I learned, until you see it, don't brag about right. it to your friends. Right. Well, one of the guys we were talking about here over the last few days that the uh, early days of stuntmen, they kept it very secret that they actually used stuntmen. So mm -hmm. the, the audience would believe, be led to believe that they were the ones jumping off the buildings sure. and jumping off the or falling around. And uh, then it became something that was actually very uh, fascinating to see how they were able to move them in and out. It is amazing. And that was some of my favorite parts of watching them when they would film those movies how they what until you see it cut together you think there's no way they're gonna believe that's John Wayne or mm -hmm. whoever it is but the way they cut it you can, they do a good job of hiding mm -hmm. you're up that's right well it's it's fascinating I know you want to take a walk into the saloon so so let's go take a walk all right let's do it all righty I'm not the link to the market.